Anger by Alexander Augustus Narrated by Daniel Collard Volume 1, Chapter 2 The operating theatre was cleared and the procedure was underway. Blinding lights shone from robotic tendrils which rotated around Elizabeth's head, forming a neon halo. As the printing nibs and dexterous drills began to build the core of Elizabeth's new body, plumes of smoke obscured the gestating shell from view. Lubricating gel seeped from nozzles and clumped down through the steam. Anxious courtiers clucked and fretted behind the two-way mirrors, peering into the lab. More than an hour passed, and Elizabeth's staff grew bored and restless. I cannot see Her Majesty! Where is her new body? It's not working! Screeched Edward Snippet, flapping his arms like featherless wings. Patience, sir, patience, said Leopold. As you can see, the robot arms are laying the foundations now. And indeed, the robotic pincers did appear to be working away albeit on something very small. Elizabeth's staff jostled for position, elbowing and pecking their way to the front of the window. Leopold's breathing was more laboured than usual, and he mopped the sweat from his brow with a handkerchief. This was only the first half of the procedure, but even so, it was happening much faster than usual. The printing arms jutted out and pulled backwards as a BEEP! BEEP! from the control bank indicated that the procedure had concluded it was fast, too fast. Smoke rose and dissipated. The operating theatre appeared to be quite empty. Where is Her Majesty? gasped Edward theatrically, in a kind of controlled shock which was both desperate and satisfied. He was distressed, but he was always happy to be proved right. Leopold rushed into the theatre, followed by a train of scientists who bustled about chaotically, no one was able to find the new shell. And Her Majesty's mind vanished into thin air? Edward flapped as he glanced over Elizabeth's human body, now lying with its consciousness uninstalled. Panicked technicians hurried around, reading charts and checking monitors from every angle. No system errors. All signs point to success. Seal off the room. Scan for a micro shell. Perhaps she's gone nano, called Leopold in a fright. We only completed the first half. She needs to enter to organic incubators. Minutes passed like hours as the lab was surveyed. Edward was biting his fingernails to stumps while fretting over how to contain this potential PR nightmare. He cast his eyes to Elizabeth's body. God have mercy! She succumbed to a stroke! He announced. He turned to Leopold. No one must reveal what you did here. Perhaps the stroke were a factor, suggested Leopold. All things considered, she were 104 years old. She's the oldest subject we ever tried. So perhaps it wouldn't be a lie? He pleaded. Many tense hours passed. Eventually, tired of waiting, Edward released Elizabeth's body to the undertaker, prepared an official line for the press, and made arrangements for a full briefing with the Windsor family. The post-mortem would confirm the signs of a stroke, and the reputation of Shell Corp would be safeguarded. All hell will break loose if the truth gets out. You can thank me later, said Edward as he strutted away. You know, when you fix the technology and my own time comes, you can get me a good shell, eh? He poked. You know it doesn't work like that, replied Leopold. Providing the computers are working without fault, your heart and your head will decide what becomes of you. If you're not evaporated, he sighed. Finally, Leopold locked the lab and left the premises in the hands of the security guards. Buttercake and Snippet adjusted the masks and gloves of their protective suits and left together. As they approached the car park, Edward glanced down 
and noticed a five-pound note stuck to the underside of Leopold's shoe. Halt where you are! Edward knelt down and plucked the note with a wry smile. It was folded neatly in two places so that it perfectly framed the Queen's two-dimensional image. Leopold gazed through his visor in a sad, distracted way. He was exhausted and preoccupied with anxiety. It appeared not to occur to him that he had carried this note from the lab, where it had slipped down through the plumes of smoke and laid in wait on the floor. Unbeknown to the fatigued doctor, this five-pound note was in fact Queen Elizabeth's new shell, and a fine coating of organic residue had adhered to the underside of Leopold's shoe when he first rushed into the theatre. This five-pound note was the form Elizabeth's subconscious had manifested, which the robotic arms had diligently wired all her functions into. Elizabeth was dazed and stunned. She couldn't feel her legs. She had no legs. She tried to move and could not. She felt sensations in her four corners and attempted to roll her edges together like a scroll. She could not. Gentlemen, put me in the incubator! One needs faculties with which to move and speak! She willed in silent panic for them to hear her. She sensed a total inability to move, to speak, to give orders. Having ruled over her subjects for almost a century, she was suddenly completely subject to their whims. Well, dear Elizabeth, you are nothing like a horse, she told herself. She could feel her surface, smooth and flat, and she could feel an incredible amount of spatial detail from the vibrations in the floor and walls, which moved through her and built an image in her mind. Her senses were different, but amazingly clear. She could not see or hear in the traditional sense, but her shell body tingled as people moved and spoke, generating a landscape around her, a topography beyond walls and floors in fact, almost like infrared or x-ray. She felt the flutter of a pigeon's wings as it landed on the roof of the building several floors up, and could almost see the wet gleam in the pigeon's eye, smell its warm odours. Spectacular, she observed with swelling intrigue. I'll take that, snapped Edward. Finders keepers, he said nastily. That'll contribute towards my overtime, thank you very much. Leopold was too preoccupied to care very much. With a shrug, he left Elizabeth in Edward's care. Oh, dear Lord, thought Elizabeth, suddenly horrified at the thought of being held captive in Edward's inner sanctum. One must spend me, Edward, she pleaded, but she had no way of stating her will. She tried to remain calm. Elizabeth was now in Edward's car, which he had driven at top speed to Balmoral from his home in Knightsbridge as soon as a text had informed him of Elizabeth's stroke. Elizabeth felt his bony, dexterous fingers fold her once more and push her into a tight money clip. The pressure was comforting. She quickly picked up their positions in the space. She felt Edward's mass, weight, body language, and she found she could easily interpret the vibrations of speech. It now occurred to her that for such a slight and frail-looking man, Edward spoke in a brash and confrontational way. Let's get out of this miserable country! he said to himself while poking at his sat-nav. All his movements blasted waves of air around Elizabeth, which vibrated little butterflies of excitement through her. If she could have giggled at the sensation, she would have. Suddenly, she felt fairly tickled at the irony of retaining her own face, albeit in two dimensions. We are, in fact, somewhat amused, she thought. Let us not take the situation too seriously. I was on my way out anyway, so all of this is a bonus she reasoned. That night, Edward pulled into a petrol station outside Leeds and exchanged Elizabeth for a packet of Harry bows and a set of wooden toothpicks. Yes, Edward, good boy, she thought, happy not to have been inducted any further into his seedy private life. Elizabeth waited in the cash register in quiet perplexity. The air did not move here. With every slight jolt, heavy coins rattled. She cast her mind back over some of the motivational words she had once used to address her subjects. When life seems hard, the courageous do not lie down and accept defeat. Instead, they are all the more determined to struggle for a better future. Well, that was all fine before she had been zapped by a laser and transformed into a five-pound note. She was the queen, for goodness sake. This is utterly ludicrous, she thought. I am the longest-serving monarch in history, not a form of currency!" 
Some hours later, the cash register sprung open and halted with a clunk, slapping Elizabeth forward. She felt the deep vibrations of conversation between the shop assistant and a customer. Look at that front page! Her Majesty the Queen, God bless her soul! said the customer, passing over cash in the palm of a plastic gloved hand. Terrible, ain't it? But at least she had a long life, a good innings, replied the cashier, straining to check the cash through his steamed up mask. They're saying she slipped away peacefully after the stroke. Well, we've all got to die somehow. Take care now. The cashier handed back change, and the customer squeaked his rubber suit towards the door. One is not dead! One is stuck in the cash register! Elizabeth screamed in her mind. Mate, that was a twenty I gave you! exclaimed the customer, doubling back. Elizabeth heard apologies, and felt another violent shuffle as she was yanked out of the register and handed to the customer. Once again, at last, she was on the move. For the next ten years, Elizabeth remained in her shell, travelling across the country, being picked up, passed on, held, valued and shared. The adjustment for her was not tough. She took solace in the fact that everyone was happy to see her, for she had suddenly gained a very practical use. And she knew her value, quite quantifiably, in fact. What a rip-off, she thought when barely covering the cost of a loaf of bread in Waitrose. What a bargain, she cheered when exchanged for nappies, soup, bread rolls and some canned tomatoes in Lidl. Elizabeth met so many people and visited so many places. In her old body, Elizabeth was always on display, always the centre of attention. But now that she was part of the scenery, she was practically invisible. She sometimes felt cheeky and voyeuristic, eavesdropping on private and vulnerable moments, and humbled more often than she could have imagined. The vibrational frequencies from the world around her often put her into a kind of meditative state, akin to the sensations which shoot from your scalp down your spine when someone plays with your hair. Being held, handled and fondled was tantamount to a massage. She had never felt so calm and she was learning to trust all those who took care of her. She did not feel pain, and although she appeared to be paper-thin plastic, her body seemed to be indestructible. Her corners were chewed by chubby babies in high chairs, she was run over by cars, and someone even tried to cut her with scissors for an art project, but to no avail. Elizabeth wondered whether she would one day need to communicate for some matter of urgency or importance. She had an intuition that the shell design must have allowed for this eventually. She wondered whether she could transform, like a chameleon or an octopus. Sometimes when her skin tingled, she felt she had the power to stimulate and influence it. Sometimes she was hosted by struggling families or dropped into charity boxes, and she hoped to transform her value to 50 pounds instead of five. If she could change her skin, perhaps she could become a postcard and get posted back to her family. She'd be able to communicate with them too, she tensed her mind and tried transforming, but it never worked. Nevertheless, she practiced often in quiet moments, sort of like a mindfulness meditation, in which she shifted her energy around her surface. It was a pleasant way to pass the time. Over time, Elizabeth felt herself becoming more streetwise. If Margaret could only see her now! Life was not the same as it had been before the disease erupted, but humans were still humans, and the messy business of life still happened. Elizabeth was taken to expensive restaurants by Russian oligarchs draped in furs and dripping in diamonds, secure in their own throne boxes, which placed a layer of glass between them and the infected world. She listened to their conversations about death threats, politics, prostitution, the value of art, the value of illegal drugs. Oh gosh, those pesky Russians! She chuckled before being scooped up and tipped to the waiter, who received the cash without any obvious protections. Elizabeth had all kinds of adventures. She was carted off to game shows where she was deposited into giant domes and blown around for lucky contestants to grab at, broadcast to millions of viewers. She was stuffed into the loose pockets of muscly teenagers who ducked and dived through the urban jungle, evading the cops in the midst of busted drug deals. And afterwards, she was rolled up, dipped into platters of powdered ketamine and used to snort the confiscated product by bent cops in the evidence locker. Oh dear, Elizabeth thought. How disappointing. 
That tranquilizer would be much better placed with the equine community for which it was manufactured. Life was far racier with the lower classes, who lived with less protection and spent her fast, as opposed to the upper classes, who would often hold on to her for weeks and lock her behind glass or in vaults. Elizabeth was tucked into the thongs of sweaty pole dancers as they gyrated under flashing neon lights, their bare flesh exposed to all the dangers of the atmosphere. She paid for an engagement ring. She was stolen at knife point in a back alley. She was donated to charity. She was given to homeless people and felt the gratitude of their receptions. Elizabeth was experiencing life, and she felt she had come to life, from the sterile past of her enclosed bubble to a future of infinite narratives. She came to realize that a five pound note has a very different meaning for a wealthy aristocrat as for a single mother struggling to get by. Elizabeth cast her mind back to her former life when it was a great taboo to have touched her, the queen. A commoner could not offer a handshake. They could only hope for the possibility of receiving one. And as queen, she was assumed to be somehow above the need for money and many of her advisors thought she should not be touching it at all. However, Elizabeth always got a thrill from playing shop, and had her butler iron down a few £50 notes every Sunday to pop into the charity box at church. He folded the edges inward, so that her printed portrait was clearly centred. The same way I was found by Edward, she reflected. After several years, Elizabeth had settled into her new life, although every now and then she heard bits of news which caused her pangs of anxiety. Pearls were becoming mainstream. On a summery autumn morning, she lounged beside an elderly woman at a breakfast table as light burst into diamonds across the frosty blue William Morris chrysanthemums of the tablecloth. The woman's purple dyed hair floated like a cloud above her sunken frame. Weak and small she appeared, almost slipping down between the oak table legs, which were fashioned into lion claws balanced on globes. She was mumbling headlines aloud to herself in a gruff voice, while adjusting her reading glasses. Plans to birth 250,000 new pearls by the end of 2040. Register for psych tests to enter lottery. Hmm. She brushed toast crumbs aside, coughed, and folded the paper to the next page. Garden of shells expanding across Scotland. Elizabeth was pinned down under a commemorative 1953 coronation pudding spoon, immaculately polished. The woman had a thin, frail hand like a dried leaf, and she placed it lightly on Elizabeth as she pulled herself forward, still sinking into herself like a collapsed souffle. Elizabeth felt the rhythms of the mechanisms working inside her. The melodies had slowed and become more complex and nuanced with age, skipping beats in worn-out parts of her body working overtime in stronger parts to pull the slack. She continued to read, Power cuts to a non-essential districts from September. The woman lifted a pair of crane-fashioned scissors and cut the article from the paper with the beak, before putting the article and Elizabeth into an envelope she addressed to her granddaughter. Elizabeth was reminded of the thoughtful care she had given her own grandchildren. It has ever been women who have breathed gentleness and care into the hard progress of humankind, she mused inside the envelope. Cash was becoming less generally circulated, the currency of the key workers and anyone else left behind. At some point, the redundancy of cash would become an urgent matter for Elizabeth. Banknotes would not be needed forever. She did not want to end up in a rubbish dump or an incinerator. Let us take it one day at a time she thought. Little did Elizabeth know that every transaction was bringing her closer to the end of this new beginning.